message this morning. Uh, it's, it's a hard message. Um, it's not hard because it's difficult to understand. It's, it's really pretty straightforward. It, it's hard because if you take these principles like I have this week, uh, and you really think about your own life and life of them, it's, it's, it's getting tricky. It's, uh, it requires change. And change is it's, it's, it's hard. And uh, so I, I want to ask you all to really think, think about your life as you go through this sermon, as I go through the sermon with you this morning. And you'll listen closely because this message is for all of us. And continuing in our sermon series, uh, in the book of Romans, the message, then we come to this chapter. It's all about disagreements. And, and that's specifically about uh, how those within the same local church are to handle disagreements with one another. And this is especially relevant in light of any disagreements we we had recently in our lives, and, and especially like today, not only within the life of this church, but within the culture, and within the country in which we live, frankly. As I consider this passage and its application, one of the things that saddens me the most uh, when it comes to the culture and the country in which we live is that we completely lost the ability to disagree. And I, what I mean by that is we lost the ability to be able to sit down with somebody that we don't agree with and to be able to talk through things in a civil manner. Sometimes myself included. We've, we've lost the ability to be able to sit down in a, in a humble way with somebody that we don't see eye to eye with on whatever the issue is, and to be able to just have a calm discussion and conversation and dialogue with each other about our differences, and then to leave there still loving each other, but still being friends with, with, another, with one another. We completely lost the ability to do that. Is it so in our country's political environment? Is it so many politicians? Is it so in cable news and talk show hosts? Is it so in posts on social media? And this is so unfortunately when it comes to pastors and Christians in the church. You know, one time I sat in a room where, uh, with, a, with church staff and, and leadership in the church. And the pastor was complaining that the church council situation, which he set up, wasn't working. And so one of the associate pastors then suggested maybe we should maybe we should think that through and consider what the Bible has to say and maybe look more at the model of others and deacons. And the senior pastor pointed in his face and said, Don't you ever talk about elders in this church again? Right there, it just shut him down. There was no room for discussion, no room to see what the Bible had to say about it, no room for healthy disagreement. You know, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of news, um, and one of the things that I've heard several times lately um, is that every evil political regime in history began. A censorship. That's where it begins. That's where we are now as a nation. Instead of healthy dialogue and conversation with people about our differences, we try to shut them up. Instead, we demonize. And we villainize them. We, uh, we assume the worst about them. We jump to conclusions about them. We label them. We Categorize them. We call them all sorts of names, and we treat them as if they're a menace to society. 
And this is the country in which we live. And what concerns me the most is that Christians and pastors and churches have gotten stuck into all of this. Like, sometimes we look no different than the world and the culture and the country in which we live when it comes to how to handle differences with people and how to respond to those that we disagree with. It's like the culture has said, hey, this is what it looks like. Here's how you treat people that you disagree with. And we just follow their example. We're like, oh, you know, that's the model? Well, that's, that's how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to behave. That's how we're supposed to treat people that we disagree with? Well, okay. I can do that. They so doing following the example of the culture and disagreeing with one another that way, it saddens the heart of God. Completely and utterly destroys it, it, it destroys our witness. So this chapter in Romans, chapter 14, is going to be a particularly relevant chapter for us. And what we're going to see within this chapter is that Paul's going to tell us how to disagree with other members in the same local church. And, and even though, like, uh, our relationships in the local church is the subject matter of Paul's commands in this passage, uh, these principles apply uh, to how we treat all Christians that we disagree with. And even, they even apply to our families, so keep that in your mind. And what Paul's basically telling us is that when we disagree with one another, love must cultivate our response. Love has to cultivate our response. And I didn't, isn't that what we heard last week in the sermon? Love your neighbor as yourself. That was the passage before this one. Love is the currency of Christianity. You know that you're a part of the body of Christ by how you spend and receive love. Do you remember that? So in Romans chapter 14, 1 through 12, Paul gives us four commands for how to love those we disagree with. And that's where we're headed this morning. How we're to respond to those we disagree with in the body. But before we jump into this, um, I want to set the scene uh, of, of what the situation is going to look like. And we kind of do like a quick recap of the book of Romans. Because all this time, this is where Paul's been headed. Everything he's covered has been building up to this point. This chapter is the heart of Paul's letter to the Romans. And here's the background. Okay? Here's the situation. In AD 41, Claudius Caesar booted all the Jews out of Rome. And it wasn't until AD 53 that they were allowed to return. Now, before they left, the Jewish believers were, were running the church in Rome. But when they returned 12 years later, guess who's running the church? The Gentiles. Specifically, the Greeks. The Greek believers. And so this led to all sorts of, like, cultural and theological tensions between the two groups. And here we are like three years later or so when Paul's writing this letter. And, uh, and here's what it looks like. The, the Jews, even, even the Christian Jews, still had a tendency to think of themselves as God's chosen people and to divide the world between the wise, the circumcised Jews, and the stupid, the uncircumcised Gentiles. So they took on like, a disposition of arrogance over everyone else. And at the same time, the Greeks, they're no different. They, they, they divided the world between the Greeks and everyone else were the barbarians. And, and they looked down on the Jews and saw them as weak for practicing soft legalism for things like keeping the Sabbath and maintaining the old covenant dietary habits. And they assumed that that God was through with the Jews and has now moved up to the blessing from, from them to the church. So the church in Rome was divided between two groups who were thinking arrogantly over one another. That's the issue. And this is a problem because the church didn't have unity. And that affects your gospel witness uh, before the unbelieving world. So Paul, like, Paul, who, who has said, that he does everything for the sake of the gospel. This, this gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation 
first for the Jew, you need to be the Right? You know that? Beginning of Romans? I don't know why I'm getting teary eyed. It doesn't make sense, but uh, I just do that. I get emotional. Um, so, um, He's writing a letter to address this problem that's ruining the church with his wickedness. And he's going to address the arrogance of both groups at different times throughout the letter. And he does it starting in chapter 2. And this is following in chapter 1 when Paul's talking about the wrath of God against all unrighteousness. And he, and he knows that the glory of God, the wrath of unrighteousness, and he talks about them seeing the power of God, and, and, and then he talks about how they, they deny that they pass an idol and all that stuff. And he knows that the Jews are hearing this and, and that they're basically uh, they're thinking that he's targeting the Gentiles. If we all kind of to maybe think that way if we want to look at that passage. And, uh, they, and, he, and they're, they're thinking, oh, yeah, well, do them. You tell them, right? The king says this in chapter 2, verse 1. Listen to this. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And in Romans, O oh man is Paul's word for the Jews. Every one of you who judges. He's calling them out for judging the Gentiles for things that they're guilty of themselves. Right? They're the ones who witnessed the power of God in the same place that, that brought them out of Egypt and freed them from Egypt. They're the ones who witnessed the power of God as they walk on the dry land between the parted waters of the Red Sea. And yet they're the ones that while Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai giving the Ten Commandments, they're at the bottom fashioning that golden calf that they can worship instead of God, that they've already seen and witnessed their life. They're guilty of the very same thing. And as I preach, you know, I, I can't help but wonder like how many of you are doing what Paul and the Jews were doing when they hear his message. I can't help but think that some of you are sitting here hoping that someone you know is listening to this message. Well, I hope so and so hears this. Right? I mean, you do a lot of things. I know I've done that. And I want to encourage you this morning to take a, a moment and just to wipe your mind of anyone else. Ask God, God, what do I need to do with what you're telling me today? What do I need to repent of? How do I need to change in a way that I respond to others that I disagree with? Is this message even just for someone else? This message is for you. And moving on, uh, you know, we so get to Jews in chapter 2. Uh, in chapters 10 and 11, we see Paul addressing the Greeks about their arrogance. Uh, if you listen to like chapter 11, verse 17 and 18, listen to this. Uh, and here he's talking about the, 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 remember the idea of the, the branches that were broken off, that's the, the Jews that, that didn't believe, and, and then the wild olive tree, the, the Greeks that are back in them. He says, but if some of you or not the Greeks, the Gentiles are back again, sorry. Uh, if, if some of you, the branches, were broken off, and you, although a wild olive tree, were grafted in among others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who's supposed to root, but the root is supposed to you hear that word arrogant? Like he's doing it both groups. He doesn't just choose a side. He's going to address both groups and tell them that they're both wrong. And here's how he does it. All right? Like Paul uses word pictures. 
And we, we miss this if we, if we go to like the 16th century translations, we miss these word pictures. The more we study, we realize like we can use these word, these word pictures uh, to help get theology across. We take something that's familiar to them in a way that they can easily understand to get it across. And so it's going to be language related to the number one pastime in Rome in the first century. Can you guess what the number one pastime in the realm is in the first century? Some of you are thinking gladiator or something like that, right? It, it's a good guess. It's better. It's not good. Really. And unfortunately for them, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of football. So, I mean, there wasn't much. They didn't have movies. So there's not much for them to do. So the number one pastime in the realm is courtroom hearings. Right? It's true. That's what they did. They would go to courtroom hearings and they listen to hearings and then they like to talk about them and, and, and that was like entertaining for them. Okay? And so this courtroom drama, that's, you know, Judge Wagner or, you know, Judge Judy. Uh, that's, what the, that's what they did. And so Paul knows that and he's going to use this language and this word picture because he knows that they understand it that way. And, and, and so he references God like he he references God as this righteous judge, this righteous and impartial judge who cannot be bribed throughout Romans. And, and he references him as that he, he's presiding over a case in which the whole world is on trial for unrighteousness. And here's the message. But if you want to know what the book of Romans is about, if you want to be able to tell somebody why Paul wrote the book of Romans, here it is, right here. Okay? Paul's writing to encourage unity among the Christians in Rome by exhorting them to humble themselves, knowing that there is no partiality in God's court between Jews and Gentiles, as they realize they are all, okay, all is a key word. When you're going through Romans, you don't think that that's one of the key words. Look at the word all. They are all in the same situation. All. They are all Jews and all Gentiles. They are all condemned by God's court. The whole world is condemned by God, this righteous judge, who is impartial and cannot be tried. And yet, and that's, that's Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and chapter 3, verse 20. And all who believe are justified by faith in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, which gives them a declaration of not guilty by God's court. That's chapter 3, verse 23 to verse. And what Paul does is, like, when he writes, he's always addressing these problems. And so he, he wants to get to an application to, to handle these problems. Uh, but before he does that, he gives this theology. He's going to before he tells them what to do, he's going to tell them why they should do it. He does this in, in like, almost all his books, or letters, they're written like this. And so in chapters 1 through 11, He's, he's going to tell you the why, and then chapters 12 to 16, he's going to give you the what. Chapters 1 through 11, he's basically, he's going to tell you, but this is kind of the message here. You have no reason to be arrogant because you haven't done anything to deserve the good that is happening to you. You deserve judgment and wrath that you were gifted justification and righteousness through your faith in Christ sacrifice on the cross that you do not deserve. That's what's really the message here. And then in chapter 12 to 16, he, he's going to give the what? Basically, he's like, therefore, because of those mercies in chapter 1 through 11 that God gives you, he's saying, be humble, love your neighbor as yourself, and be unified. That's the message. So, well, if you remember, like, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, well, uh, I mean, I remember when Jonathan uh, preached this. And I'm sure Pastor Sue, you, I don't know, I didn't hear it, I'm sorry, I wasn't here. But uh, he says, therefore, and therefore is his transition word from the, the theology, from the, from the theology to the application. Okay? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember, Jonathan said, your plural bodies are one living sacrifice. And that is a living back to the Old Testament dead sacrifices 
which they would take this dead animal and they break it up into many parts and they took it in different ways. Right? It's, but, it, so, but it's still one sacrifice. And here we are a living sacrifice. It's, and it's all about corporate body life. And then he says, uh, in verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. And the pattern of this world that Paul is talking about, what he's, in Romans, what he's thinking of is this arrogance. Okay? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What if, if you're thinking arrogantly over one another, how do you renew your mind? You humble yourself. And we know that's what he's talking about because in verse 3, he says it. And I'm going to share this with you. He said, uh, so you, it says, don't think any higher of yourselves than you ought to think. Right? That is, don't be arrogant. Be humble. That's, that's the message. So then, the rest of chapter 12, he goes through and he's like talking about this, how we are many members of one body. Right? And alluding back to that Old Testament sacrifice, that dead sacrifice is one body but in many parts. We're many members of one body. And then he gets. In chapter 13, when he's talking about how we as justified believers and how our conduct towards, and he's talking about our conduct towards the state and towards others. And the message is that ultimately this love your neighbor as yourself. So now we get to chapter 14. And this is where Paul gets to the heart of the issue. All of the arrogance and judging and arguing because of the soft legalism of some of the Jews, the weak, maintaining certain Jewish practices, not because they thought it would save them, but because they felt like that's what a good Christian should do. Okay? And all of that, uh, and, the, and the struggling with others in the church and not keeping those practices. Well, some of the Greeks, the, 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 the strong, are basically looking down on the Jews for not recognizing the freedom as believers and no longer, they no longer be required to keep those practices. So that all these traditions can address this. But here's the thing I want you to understand, okay? These issues that we're talking about are not essential to the Christian faith. They're not essential doctrines to, that a believer must believe in order to be saved or in order to live uh, a holy life as a Christian. And they're not essential to your relationship with God. They're non essential. You're going to hear me use that word over and over again. They're secondary issues. They're, they're what we might call gray areas, where the, the Bible doesn't clearly get one way or another. And it's interesting here that Paul doesn't take sides. He's going to basically tell both groups that the answer to your disagreements with one another is to love your neighbor yourself. So in Romans 14, 12, uh, 14, 1 through 12, Paul gives us four commands for how to love those we disagree with on non essential issues. And what I want you to do as we go through these is to think about a situation in which you have had like a disagreement with another person, another believer, over something that wasn't an essential doctrine in the Christian faith. Uh, I, like it, may, it may not even be a, a doctrinal issue. It could be a disagreement you have with someone at the church or another believer at work or at home. So right now, I just want you to stop and really think about a situation where you had a disagreement and argued with someone and grown hard feelings for them, or you judged them. And I want you to think of this passage as, as if Paul is talking to you. Okay? So Paul's first command for how to love those we disagree with on, on non-essential issues is this. Accept them because God accepts them. Right. Look at verse 1. It says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome. Right. That word welcome, the Greek word there, refers to a, a, like this personal and willing acceptance of another person. It means more than like to allow to remain in membership. It, it means to, to take someone in with like a strong personal interest. It, it has the idea of, of hospitality. Uh, the uh, the idea to receive them the way you would welcome someone into your own home. Welcoming them into your own family. That's the idea of tenderness, of 
granting this person access to your heart, and taking it in and cleansing it. You're right. Don't just let them in the house. Invite them to raise your fridge and kick off their shoes and binge watch your favorite show or your favorite ball game. Okay. You know, so you have that attitude towards people who you disagree with in the church. That's what he's saying. You need to have that kind of attitude. Not to be, to be made, they're not to be made to feel like they're it's barely tolerated and seen as second class citizens. Right? Don't make little clicks in your little group of all the people that agree with you and leave them out. They be received with warmth and complete fellowship. You know, when I, I, in high school, I used to be the guy, like, whenever there's like a group of cool people standing in a circle. I was always standing behind that circle. And uh, and so when I became a Christian and I'm in college, uh, I remember like a group of us are standing in a circle. And I said, hey, I got an idea. Let's, let's maybe get some of us. Just leave a little space open and I bet you somebody will fit. And so we made a gap open. Guess what? Somebody walked in and just gave him a tour. I said, hey, let's do it again. We, we made another game, right? Somebody else came forward. Like, let's do it again. And we kept doing it, and our, our circle just got bigger and bigger. That's the attitude that we need to have with people, even people we disagree with. We need to be open and create a space for them, create a place for them. Welcome them. Uh, and then, look at the end of verse 3. Here's the reason that Paul gives why we should welcome them. He said, for God is welcome to This is where God's kind of like this good, this good justification comes into play, okay? If God has forgiven him and welcomed him into his family, then you ought to do the same. He's justified hard by faith. You need to welcome the brother and sister that you disagree with because God welcomes them. Accept them because God accepts them. You realize that when you don't accept a brother or sister over an essential issue, you're basically saying that God is wrong. I mean, that's the message that you're conveying. Hey, so so I know that you were told that all who believe in Jesus have the right to be called children of God. But you don't eat the way I think you should eat. You're too caught up in celebrating certain days that I don't. You think you have to get a vaccine. You won't get a vaccine. You want to spend church money in different places than I think we should. You're too strict about alcohol. You fill in the blank. What is it for you? What is the subject of the difference for you? What small thing have you made into such a big thing that you've let it come between you and a church member or between you and a family member? All believers are in a different place. We don't all have the same knowledge, nor the same convictions, nor the same freedom from tradition, nor the same strength of, of appropriating our faith. We're all in a different place. And we have no right to say to the other believers, you know, sit back until I'm satisfied about you. Because that puts your will between yourself and God's children. But what Paul is telling us is that we need to treat them the way God treats them. He treated them like the father of the prodigal son who ran into his ran into his son, like he welcomed him home with open arms and threw a celebration for him. And when we can't lovingly accept another believer over a non-essential issue, we are basically behaving like the other son, who couldn't join in on the celebration that the father threw for his son to come home. You ever think of it that way? The theologian John Stott once said, How dare we reject the person whom God has rejected? Indeed, the best way to determine what our attitude toward other people should be is to determine what God's attitude to them is. This principle is better than the golden rule. 
It's safe to treat others as we would like them to treat ourselves. But it is safer still to treat them as God does. So that's the first way uh, we're to love those we disagree with over our essential issues. The second command of God, which is what Paul gives, he says, don't argue with them. Look again at verse 1. As for the one who is weak for faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Right? I mean, we're not to argue, we're not to fight, we're not to quarrel over the different opinions and decisions and conclusions that we come to regarding these non-essential issues. Some people just want to, they want everyone to believe and think exactly as they do. Right? Right? Like, they, they're always right. There's no room for differences of opinion. There's no room for other perspectives. Every hill is a hill to buy. They can't just stay quiet on something. They think it's their duty to inform you that you're wrong about minor differences. So they turn in hills into mountains, right? Some of you are like that. And sometimes I'm like that. Sometimes we start fighting arguments over minor secondary issues that are way less important than the relationship we are damaging by demanding that they perform God's work. And Paul said, accept them, but not just so you can get a chance to pick at them and argue with them, not so you can just tell them how wrong they are. That's not loving. That's arrogance. After all, you may be the one who's wrong. I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. Always the same, we can't discuss differences. Like, healthy dialogue and debates are fine. Um, the key is to approach these conversations with humility and a positive attitude rather than arrogance. Ensure your focus is on understanding the person rather than just enforcing your own views. Do you know what the difference between a healthy discussion and arguing is? One seeks to understand the other person, to listen, and to learn why they believe the way they believe. It comes from an attitude of loving and caring about the other person. The other way seeks to change the other person without listening or understanding. It's self centered and it's selfish. And love has nothing to do with it. And I think we say we are all guilty of that. But what Paul's saying here is to beware of arguing and fighting and pride so that it divides you and becomes divisive in the church. Because it destroys the testimony of the church and it hinders the gospel. Don't try to force your opinions on them. Don't try to force your convictions on them. Don't try to change them. Don't try to play the Holy Spirit with them, that's not their job. That's between them and God. So don't impose your convictions over not a simple issue from others. Well, the third command that Paul gives of how to love those we disagree with on not a simple issue is this. He says, don't despise them. He goes on to say, in verses 2 and 3, if you look there, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who eats. Paul here is talking to the Gentile Christians who know they have the freedom to eat meat, looking down on the Jewish Christians who abstain from eating meat. This word despise, it, it refers to like this intense feeling of hate. Disgust or loathing. It makes you look down on it. And it's a form of hatred. Let's be honest. Right? Like, this is the temptation, isn't it? The temptation when we disagree is to look down on the other person. First, we, we argue instead of trying to understand them. And when they don't agree, we, we, we try to keep their minds the way we want them to. 
Uh, and when they don't do that, we become frustrated. And out of that frustration and out of that anger, we begin to develop feelings of superiority about that other, uh, ourselves and, and, and inferiority about them. We start to think we're a better Christian than they are. We start to think I am a, I'm a better person than they are. I might not realize you that, but that's, that's what's happening in your mind. And we resort to looking down on them. And loathing them. Again, to despise them is a form of hatred and rejection of a person God loves. I mean, that someone who God has given justification and righteousness to. And He's given them membership in His family. And we're, and we're hating that person and rejecting them. That's the third command Paul gives. But how we're to love those we disagree with on non essential issues. Because we'll despise them. And, and that's going to lead, because eventually that, that's going to play out. That's going to begin to show its ugly face in our behavior. And, that, and that's going to lead us to the fourth thing, the final thing we did, which says, don't judge them. Look at the rest of verse 3. It says, and let not the one who abstains. Pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. You see what Paul's doing here? He isn't picking sides. He is correcting both groups for their arrogance. He says to the Gentile believers that's exercising their freedom by eating meat, not to disdain the Jewish believers who don't. But then he just turns it around and tells the Jewish believers who don't, I mean, the, the yeah, the Jewish believers who don't not pass judgment on the Gentile believers who exercise their freedom on these non essential issues. That's the temptation. Strict judgment on the person who exercises their freedom in a way they, that you don't. The temptation is to assume that you're a better or more mature Christian. So it begins with, with a disagreement, and then you begin to argue in a self centered way that says, My way is the only way, so you better comply. And then, and then when they don't comply, you begin to feel disdain towards them or you pass some judgment on them. And here's what that looks like here's how it plays out you, you start name calling, you label them. How much time do I have? Okay, I'll hurry. All right. Uh, all right. So maybe you you attack their territory. You begin to find people who agree with you and complain to them about the other person. You gossip about the one you disagree with on these non-essential issues. Right, raise your hand if you, have, if you haven't done that. If you haven't gossiped about somebody, that's judging them. That's what that is. As Mother Teresa pointed out, when we are judging others, we have no time to love them. It's only in suspending our judgment that we open our hearts to unconditional love and empower ourselves and each other to be the best we can be. You know that being like half a chance, people will often will, will crawl out of the boxes into which we were relegated in. They will. Stop judging other believers for issues that are secondary to the Christian faith. And Paul's going to give us a couple reasons, and I'll get to these really quick. Uh, it's like why we're not to despise or judge our brother or sister for disagreeing with us on these constant issues. And here's the first reason: it's because they're seeking to honor the Lord. Look there at verses five and six. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats eats in honor of the Lord. And she gives thanks to God, while the one who stands and stands in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So you see what Paul's concern is here. He ultimately doesn't care whether they eat meat or don't eat meat, or whether they keep the Sabbath or don't keep the Sabbath. His concern is that whatever conclusions they come to, they come to those conclusions and seek and honor the Lord. It's a matter of the heart. Right? Like the motive of your heart to honor the Lord might lead you. So one conclusion on non-essential issues, 
and yet the motive of another person's heart to honor the Lord might lead them to a completely different conclusion. But that's all right. It's okay. You don't have to come to the same conclusion so long as it's an issue that is not an essential doctrine to the Christian faith. In both situations, the Lord is honored, and that's what matters the most. Here's the second reason that we're not to judge and despise those we disagree with over not simply issues is this, because God is the only judge. Ultimately, they don't answer to us. Paul says in verse 4, he says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make him stand. So then, you see, that's the picture of Paul's campaign here. First, he's painting this picture of a slave and his master, which is something that they would all be familiar with in their day. And then he's saying, there was only one person that you must, uh, you must answer to if you're a slave. There's only one person whose opinion ultimately matters about what you do or don't do. And that was your master. That was the only person whose opinion mattered because he was the only person you were going to ultimately be held accountable to and have to answer to. And that same thing is true for us as Christians. You're not to judge other believers over these non essential things because you're not their master. Jesus is their master. He's the one that everybody's ultimately going to be held accountable to and must give an account to and an answer to. In verses 7 through 9, and I'm almost done here, he puts it this way. He says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. You hear that? So that this end, Christ died in the beginning, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. John MacArthur says about these verses, he says it this way. He says, the focus of the Christian living is never oneself. Everything we do should be to please our sovereign God, Lord. Christ died not only to free us from sin, but also to enslave us to himself. Not the way we can put slavery to it. For his will to be done in our lives. To establish himself as sovereign over the saints and his presence and those still on earth. So we are the Lord's. He's our loving master. This is why it matters that we seek to honor the Lord. And since that's true, we need to be really careful about passing judgment on others in these issues and acting like we're their master that they have to obey. Because we're not their master. I say that to my kids all the time. Like I'm like, quit trying to discipline your brother. That's my job. Right? If, if I didn't discipline them over this with you, if I gave them grace, then you're out of line trying to discipline them. And the one who ever sets their boundaries in my family uh, and, and assumes my role in the family winds up being the one who gets in trouble. So, and lastly, Paul says this. He says, like, if you look at verse 10, it says the same exact thing. He says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? For you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So here, Paul goes to the thing that uh, God is this righteous judge, and he's basically saying, You have no business judging anyone else. When you yourself will stand before the judgment seat of God, God is the only judge. Like when someone is on trial in a court of law and they're having to give a defense of their actions, they think it could be ludicrous to think that they can just go and push the judge off his judgment seat and then they start judging people. Right? I mean, that, that would never work in a million years. And when we judge someone else, we're basically attempting to put God off of this judgment seat. In other words, we are attempting to play God. We're God. It's an insult to God when we pretend to be someone's master or judge. And I'm talking about 
because they honestly believe he's in value of Christ. There are times for judgment, but that's not what we're talking about. So, the next, Paul's message is basically this. When we disagree with one another, love must cultivate a response. And then Paul gives us four commands how to love those we disagree with. He says we accept them because God accepts them. He says we don't argue with them, we don't despise them, we don't judge them. Why? Because they seek to honor the Lord and because God is the only judge. Here's the deal. You cannot do this on your own. Being humble towards others will only lead to self-righteousness if you don't first humble yourself before God. How do you know that you're humble before God? One way is to look at your relationships and you can make it. Do you always have your way? I mean, I have your way. Do you think other people's opinions are not as important as your own? Honestly, examine yourself. If you aren't humble before others, then you aren't humble before God. And the other way is to look at your relationship with God. Are you surrendered to Him? Have you come to a place where you are so desperate that you've said, God, I give up. I can't do this on my own. From this day forward, I just want what you want. Your will be done in my life. Have you done that? If you can't do that, you won't be able to do these other things. But if you humble yourself before God, He'll give you what you need to be able to love those who disagree with you. God, thank you so much for this message. God, thank you for your word and how you showed us how to love others we disagree with. And Father, we just come before you today and we pray that you would help us as a church, each and every one of us, to recognize the sin in our lives uh, regarding how we relate to others. Help us to repent. Help us to ask forgiveness of you and others and to begin to live in a way that expresses humility and unity and strengthen our gospel witness as believers and as a church before the rest of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.